In this polished mirror of the gospel, a Christian sees not only the truth about God, but a clear reflect reflection of himself as well. The gospel reproduces an image of oneself. It rebukes what is ungodly, so that one might repent and be healed. At the same time, the mirror of the gospel foreshadows or makes known in a figure both the unfading beauty of heaven as well as the torments of Gehenna. And so the activity of the Christian is to keep the eye of his mind or his spiritual gaze focused intently on the commandments of God. For what a Christian must know and about which he must remind himself, this is set forth in the gospel. St. Ephraim relates that the word of God offers the nations a mirror which shows how death clandestinely is devouring their lives. And again he reminds us, take firm hold then of this clear mirror of the divine gospel in your hands and look at it with a pure eye that is able to look at that divine mirror. Just as the rule of faith summarizes the gospel teaching, so the gospel reflects what a Christian must understand. For this reason, St. Ephraim says that this living mirror speaks. It speaks to Christians who engage the scriptures according to the rule of faith. We also know that scripture is not subject to private interpretation, according to the Apostle Peter, but it is interpreted within the body of the church. The church is that community in which the constant interpretation or engagement of the scripture is taking place. It offers an unceasing explanation of Christ according to the scriptures, which takes place within the church and by the church as a community of living interpreters, speaking of the word, as worshipers of the word, united with one mind and one heart. For what we learn from the Bible is that the work of Jesus Christ is to make known the Father. And this we read in the Gospel according to John, on the Monday after Pascha. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him, or made him known, or literally exegeted or interpreted him. As a community, we are responsible for how we hear the Word of God. As it is preached publicly in church, encountered in our constant reading of Scripture, portrayed figuratively in icons, interpreted by the Holy Fathers, and recognized in daily life encounters. For these life encounters are icons as well. We honor our neighbor, for he is made in the image of God. Orthodox Christian life is precisely a preparation for the task of hearing, of reading, and of interpreting the Word of God in and for our community. And the history of the church can be spoken of as a history of interpretation. The precise interpretation of Christ continues each day, and in every age, in a manner that addresses each culture. For the public preaching of the church is an interpretive act, that is, it makes Christ known to the world in every place where the church is sojourning. And each time the scripture is read, in harmony with the rule of faith, it yields a new synthesis that speaks meaningfully to the world around us, to every culture around us, even in new words. And each time the church performs this task, the church is sending us back again to the scripture to bring forth a word that is ever fresh, always filled with power, and perpetually renewing the minds and hearts of human beings. This is the task of mission. Now while proclaiming the gospel according to the scriptures, it is indispensable to know to whom we are bringing the words of eternal life. St. Innocent of Alaska offered the following advice in his missionary instructions. Make it your business to find out all about the religion, rites, customs, tastes, disposition, and all that makes up the life of your parishioners. More especially in order to be able, the more surely and easily to influence them. Note, it is of no little importance for your success that you should do justice to any good customs that they may have. What St. Innocent recommended 170 years ago is vital for us today. 
These instructions imply that we should make every effort to identify with the people with whom we are sharing the gospel. If we are to, going to offer them our story, we must take care to understand theirs. And in doing this, we might learn that we have the key to the proper response to everything that is important to them. It is also a way to make their life meaningful. First, by our attention, by opening our minds, by finding out on what strengths the proclamation of Christ can be established in their midst. This is a scriptural task. It is exactly what the Apostle Paul did in Athens. He even told the Athenians they were already worshipping him, but still did not know who he was. Paul set out to utilize the good foundation that was already there. And such an effort to find existing strengths and to add to those strengths shows our respect for others. It shows that their life is full of meaning. It indicates that one has been listening to his neighbor. Every time that we presume to satisfy the thirst of our neighbor by insensitively, insensitively offering our homogenized Greek or Russian forms, it indicates that we have not listened to our neighbor, that we have not walked a mile with our neighbor, that we have not prepared to offer a cup of cold water to our neighbor. It also indicates that we presume that the teaching of the scripture and of the Orthodox faith is self-interpreting or self-evident. And this surely contradicts the plea of the Ethiopian eunuch in the Acts of the Apostles. And when Philip asked him if he understood what he was reading, the eunuch replied, how can I unless someone would guide me? Philip's response was to set forth an interpretation of the prophecy of Isaiah that we call the Song of the Suffering Servant, so as to explain who Jesus Christ is according to the rule of faith. And Philip explained this passage as the church understands it, not as a self-interpreting passage, but as a passage that requires a human agent to unpack or unlock the treasure within that passage. For the time in which he lived, to someone with a different set of values. He explained this passage so that his answer corresponded to the need of the Ethiopian eunuch. It was the right word, at the right moment, in the right place. All the Ethiopian could say in reply was, Here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Our reflection on interpretation and culture affects our understanding and program of missiology. It has a direct application to the theme of this conference. Last night, Turbo pointed to the fact that outreach to the African American community is lacking, especially in the light of the gospel imperative to evangelism or the Great Commission. Go forth and make disciples of all nations, and teaching them all things that I have commanded you. This imperative of evangelism requires that we study and learn the cultural language or heritage of the African American community. That we understand the metaphors, hyperbole, rhetoric, and preaching of the African American community. This would be the broader implication of another instruction of St. Innocent. Quote, in order to be more faithfully, in, to be, in order to be more faithfully of the greatest possible service to your parishioners, you should quickly learn at least so much of their language as you will enable you to understand them. This is this is what we can refer to as a, a greater cultural language. Before anything else, respect must be shown for the myths or sacred stories the history, and the heroes of the community. This is a body of literature that was once primarily oral and living. For in the African American experience, the people were systematically prevented from learning how to read and write with the intention of crippling their community. Their early history is primarily an oral history. As such, it was shaped by song. The culture is a treasury of art that includes music, architecture, textiles, jewelry, science, philosophy, service, and labor. 
as dominant aspects of their heritage. This requires us to become like brothers, to pave the road to understanding with love, respect, and affection. Only then will the words we have to share appear sincere. Only then will they become understandable. God desires worshippers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And perhaps some of us, by constant reflection on the commandments of God, will respond to the word of the Lord with a burden to communicate the rule of faith in ways that bring meaning into the life of our neighbor. This requires that we listen not only to God, but also to human beings, to learn their stories, their sufferings, their words, their joy, as the keys to speak the word of God at the right time, in the right place, with the right understanding. Without making someone else our brother or sister first, we will not have their ear. This calls us to worship side by side, as neighbors, as sheep of the same sheepfold. This represents a small start in fulfilling the commandment of God to love your neighbor as yourself. So let us keep the doors of the sheepfolds wide open. Let us stand by the doors to welcome the sheep of Christ. In this way, perhaps, we will see more sheep than the words John Norman used look like me. Now, I was told we're supposed to have discussion, reproach. <laughs> experiencing what you've experienced that someone else will understand your perspective. So it's very hard, but I think I think uh, an example kind of in a sense of within the church, pastor to pastor, friend to friend, you can't issue a decree. Nobody's gonna pay attention to it. Uh, I think that a uh, little beginning here, little and of course, of course, there's applications to other communities and subcultures, cultures, etc. Big applications. The same in the same day. Thank you. 
there's, there isn't a substitute for that. There's no substitute for pouring oil and wine on wounds. Well, please, some antiseptic and bad dates or something. There isn't, there isn't a, another way that's hard. Uh, that, but acknowledging and sharing, acknowledging, first of all, someone else's pain is a very important step. And until that's affirmed, and still they know that someone else acknowledges what they've been through, then it's not hard to go on. They can't focus on that. I mean, they can, they can take it with them. But maybe it'll, it'll allow them to leave it behind sometime, at some point. When we talk about the learning another person's culture, that's, um, that's no small thing. And part of learning that culture and learning the language, as you spoke of, is not the lingo of, but the language of, of, of the history of the people, how that people um, came to develop. And, and I think that that is one thing that we can teach. And it's also actually lacking amongst us who, who don't even know about the contributions that we have made, not only to this country, but to, you know, all to Christianity in North America. And so uh, that's one of the ways that we began, you know, to, uh, to get inside um, a culture that we may not be familiar with. And I, and I would address this to, to people who, um, you know, who have been part of the Brotherhood and people who are in this room who, who, who are interested in our work is, is to learn about our culture. You know, we have a, we, we've been more than, um, been more than slaves in this country. We've built schools, we've, we've built communities, we've built a part of this nation. And quite honestly, the, the younger generation doesn't even know about it. And, and, I, and I had to use this twice in the same, same within the 24 hours, but, but the people in the pencil, in living on the hill don't even know that that was, a, you know, what I consider to be a holy place. Not just, not by using it in a loose sense, but an actual holy place where people prayed and they said, God, please deliver us from this certain danger. And he delivered them and brought them to the hill. So if we don't know that part about, uh, about, about our history, then, then uh, we're going to have a very hard time speaking, uh, speaking to people about their culture. We will be speaking to them about the most uh, condescending part of of of, um, of our relationship with them if we only learn the language. Did that was that, was that clear? Yes, yes. I have to make sure I'm clear. Thank you. So on these little ABCs, Father Moses came to my rescue this last fall, and I asked him a couple little questions, and he said. You need to read about Henry Bibbs. Now, what a wonderful, beautiful thing. Just ABCs. And in doing that, actually, it was very interesting. I found out that there are even, they had this little website where you could go and in each state, find places that are marked by the Underground Railroad. I thought, how many people, and obviously here, for example, how many Orthodox people, had taken their family on a family vacation, say north, south, or east, west, and gone and stopped at those places, read those stories, seen their pictures. It's an amazing thing. It's like an amazing resource out there. It actually shows up some of our ignorance. Kind of vast, vast ignorance. And the resources are there. That's even without a, somebody walking you through it. Just to scratch the surface. To become ever so slightly more aware. 
even part of our own larger history. It's very interesting. So if you haven't read Henry Bibbs, you'll have to read this. Amen. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and I'll meet you back here in a